Dr. Thies, thank you so much for spending time with us. We're very much looking forward to your upcoming Grand Rounds entitled The Human Interstitium as a Body-Wide Communication Network. Can you start off by telling us your definition of interstitium? I'll start off by telling you everyone else's <laughs> definition of interstitium because I wandered into this field. I'm a liver pathologist. Um, and um, I wandered into this field kind of by happenstance, um, which I'll explain. Um, but historically, when people have referred to the interstitium, they've been referring to interstitial spaces in the body, human, mammals, several different kinds of animals, um, uh, at two different scales. The first is um, an interstitial space between neighboring cells. Now, most cells that abut each other in the body have tight junctions, so there's no space between them. But some cells have a space that's maintained. And an example of this would be the squamous lining of your skin or any squamous linings inside your body like that of the esophagus. Um, you can see with a light microscope that there are spaces between the, the cells that make up the squamous epithelium. Um, between fat cells, you have spaces. Between muscle cells, you have spaces. Most, uh, but uh, let's say the rest of the GI tract, you know there has to be a tight boundary between the lumen of the GI tract and uh, the body um, that's going to be absorbing stuff from the GI tract. Uh, if you have leaky uh, uh, a leaky boundary there because the cells are not tightly held, that, that leads to disease states and, and leaky bowel, leaky gut. That's what they're talking about. The cells are not tightly held together. But there are some cells that are not tightly bound together, and there are reasons for that, um, specific to each tissue and each cell type. Now there's, um, and so that's been well known for, you know, since we had microscopes and could look at tissues under the microscope. Another space, and this is the one that's predominantly been the focus of interstitial research through the decades um, into the modern era, are the spaces around capillaries. It's often been referred to as the perivascular interstitium. Um, being a pathologist, I'm very sensitive to microanatomy, so I prefer to call it the pericapillary interstitium because it isn't the space around an arterial or an artery or around a vein or a venule. Um, it's uh, pretty much restricted to around the capillaries. And this is where um, nutrients that are coming in from the blood into a tissue, they uh, flow out of the capillary space into the space of the adjacent tissues where it can then reach the cells that depend on that nutrient, those nutrients. And on the other hand, waste products from those cells diffuse across this perivascular, pericapillary interstitium, like carbon dioxide, for example, so that it can travel in the blood to be excreted in the, in the case of CO2 back out through the lungs. So when people have talked about the interstitium or interstitial spaces, they're usually referring to these two things and they're microscopic. You can't see them grossly. Between cells, you may be speaking about, um, uh, you know, less than a micron, so very tiny. Around capillaries, usually talking around 10 microns, so one hundredth of a millimeter. Sometimes in a few spaces like the small intestine, it's 50 to 80 microns. Um, so that's what's been known as the interstitium. And in those tissues, you can see that there may be a relationship when those two compartments are together. So the line, the skin, um, if you look under the microscope where you see the capillaries in the dermis are very close. So you could imagine maybe there's a relationship. But in general, they're sort of thought of as being discrete areas uh, in, in different tissues. Um, and there hasn't been, to my knowledge, much discussion about how this could be a continuous network through the body. Um, the other primary function of the interstitium is that the fluid that filters through that is also what becomes lymph in the lymphatic system. So lymphatics, um, uh, unlike uh, blood vessels, which don't have any openings with a few minor exceptions in the body, um, they're just a continuous tube that no matter where you chop it, you've got a continuous uh, closed system. 
lymphatics begin with an open stoma, an open mouth, through which fluid comes in from the interstitium, and that fluid flows into the lymphatics, and that's where lymph comes from. Um, and, and that definition is what helped us identify what we're doing, which I'll be talking about in a little more detail and graphically with pictures in my talk. So what we found was that um, I was, uh, this is when I was at Beth Israel Medical Center in New York, not at Harvard. And though I'm a liver pathologist, I was in the GI division because they wanted a liver pathologist in their offices training their fellows about hepatology. And so uh, a couple of the uh, endoscopists there, David Carlock, who used to be at Harvard and came to, to BI from there, um, and one of his trainees, Petrus Benias, they had this fancy endoscope that allowed them to do in vivo microscopy endoscopically. So they could look at the esophagus, the lining of the stomach, the lining of the colon, the small intestine um, in real time microscopic level um, in the living tissue. And, you know, this is a kind of an attempt of endoscopists to try and steal business from the pathologists. If they can see the microscopic stuff there, do they really need us looking at the microscopy on a biopsy? Um, but they saw something and pretty much what they expected to see they saw, including interstitial spaces within the lining of the esophagus and um, pericapillary spaces within the, um, the finger-like projections, the villi of the small intestine. And they do this by injecting a, a, a fluorescent dye into a peripheral vein. And within a couple of minutes, it spreads, even seconds, it spreads throughout all the fluid spaces of the body. And this scope, what's special about it is it has a fluorescent confocal um, laser that allows them to see the fluorescence in the living tissue. And they saw pretty much what they expected to see. And on the basis of those findings, they could start to say when there was disease or not um, that correlated with what we see histologically under the microscope. But when they got into the pancreatic duct and the bile duct, they didn't see what they expected to see. Um, both the wall of the bile duct and the pancreatic duct, uh, which is technically the submucosa of those organs, when you look at them under the microscope, they're a dense wall of collagen. Um, and you see that there are kind of cracks in it when you look under the microscope. And, um, uh, and we always thought that's artifact because collagen is so stiff that when you cut it to make a thin section on a slide, it cracks. Well, what they were seeing wasn't this dense wall with no fluorescence because there'd be no fluid in it. They were seeing these dark bands interweaving together like a net or a sponge and between them big light filled spaces meaning it was filled with fluid and they didn't know how to interpret that and because i my office was next door to theirs in the endoscopy uh division um they just came and asked me because i'm looking at tissues under the microscope all the time and working with the liver transplant team i'm looking at bile ducts all the time and i didn't know what this was um and so trying to figure out what it was is part of what I'll be talking about in the talk, how we came up, how we, how we figured it out. But the nutshell is that the dense connective tissue of the wall of the bile duct and the pancreatic duct are not like this in living tissue. They're like this. Um, the dark bands they were seeing are the thick bundles of collagen that support this network of fluid filled spaces. That's the real. And when we dehydrate tissues to make them into slides to sort of mummify them as we fix them, they collapse. So those things that we thought were just artifactual cracks, those are remnants of the original spaces. Um, so we thought, you know, okay, this is something strange about the bile duct. Why does it have this weird space? But because at that time I was seeing, I was a general pathologist clinically and I was seeing the entire GI tract, I was seeing breast tissues, lungs, et cetera, um, quickly noticed that these cracks are present in every collagen layer, no matter what organ we were looking at. And we figured out ways to study this. And it turns out this is a third scale of interstitial space that's much larger. In fact, some of it can actually be seen with the naked eye. If I were to take you down to the pathology lab, um, and tease apart some layers of a colon, let's say, I could show you the interstitium. You wouldn't even need a magnifying 
So when we reported this as a novel interstitium, um, we were saying it's related to these other spaces. Um, and we could prove that it is an interstitial space because we're able to show that it's pre-lymphatic, uh, that lymph is deriving from these. And we could show it in that original paper, we could show tumor cells that are moving from the invading, the spot of invasion um, into the lymphatics to get to the lymph node, proving that that's a pathway um, that also is the normal pathway for lymph. So, um, the press release went out for this, and we didn't say this in the paper, but the press release that went out from the institutions involved talked about the possibility that it's a new organ. And that kind of went viral, not because people necessarily perceived it as that significant, but there was like no other exciting scientific news that week. Stephen Hawking died two weeks before, and that was the big story. Had he died this week, no one would know that this work existed. And, you know, it would have gotten very little attention, but instead it went viral. Um, our media department estimated that 3.8 billion people saw the news, and that's before the it got translated into Chinese and came out in China. Wow. Um, and so we got a lot of attention all of a sudden. And because of this idea, is this a new organ? That was sort of the driving force. And um, and and. You know, it could be, that's one way of thinking about what we've found here, that the interstitium is not just these little separate microscopic spaces, but there's some sort of organized system structure in the body that's a very large scale. And so, you know, could it be an organ was really the question. Um, we have follow-up ideas on that, which, um, you know, if people want to ask me about, we can discuss. 